Marquise Medical Talks. Personal injury. Leaders in Alabama Medical. So thank you, Dr. C. Warnett, for your time today. So I'm going to ask you 10 questions, and it's kind of open-ended. Um, um, I'd like you to tell us about how a Brooklyn College star basketball player becomes a dominant figure in the field of chiropractic healthcare. How did you evolve into healthcare from being in basketball? Well, that's an interesting question. So I went to Brooklyn College. I played basketball for the school, got injured probably midway through my junior year. I had a uh, hip injury and went through the traditional medical route uh, with our team orthopedic surgeon and our team physicians, and the problem got worse. So I decided to see a chiropractor our athletic trainer and a physical therapist. I was so impressed by what they did that I changed my major from pre-med to physical education and exercise physiology. So I was so saying, so so your so your influence with um, the way they treated you and recovery from being a basketball player kind of made an impression on you to change your entire career. That's correct. So I was pre-med the first two years I was in college. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, I didn't know anything about chiropractic, but I found out as a chiropractic patient what chiropractic could do and what it was all about. Wow. So I was so impressed that I, I wound up changing my major, graduating in January, and then teaching high school physical education in Brooklyn for six months, and then moved to Davenport, Iowa to go to Palmer College of Chiropractic. Wow. And that's how it's that's yeah, like how it, that's how the journey unfolded into chiropractic your chiropractic profession. When one door closes another one opens. So yeah. you know for me it was interesting as it is for many people how they get into chiropractic. Many of us have gotten in on a personal basis where traditional health care might not have worked for what we had, and we went to chiropractors as a, either a first or a last resort. Awesome. In my case, it was a last resort. Yeah. But it's interesting because yeah. it also shows your personal story and your passion behind, you know, the important, importance of chiropractic care. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was musculoskeletal. You know, it was, uh, it was a pretty bad hip injury for a 19-year-old. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I... Uh, I fought through that and continued to play and had a good career and then um, just, you know, moved on. Had some offers to play in Europe that I turned down to go to chiropractic school, actually. Wow. Because, you know, at that time, European basketball wasn't, you know, wasn't where it is today. You know, although the opportunity was there, I knew it was short-lived. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go to chiropractic school instead. And then graduated in September of 1979, moved down here to read the x-rays and teach at Life University, mm -hmm. which I did, and then opened up my office uh, September, October, November, December, four months later. Wow. Wow. That's exciting. Um, during your 30-year career, um, you foster deep connections with your patients as well as fellow chiropractors and physicians. Um, we're curious as to know why you're so passionate about relationships and connecting professionals together. Well, because we know that healthcare is relationship-driven. The three R's of healthcare are relationships, referrals, and reimbursement. So traditionally, chiropractors are afraid to make referrals to medical providers for fear of losing patients. But if they know these doctors personally, they feel a lot more comfortable in the reviewing process or in the referral process. And then it really creates a much better situation for the patient because it allows for a collaboration, a team effort in treating the patients. And that collaboration usually winds up with patients having better outcomes and a higher success rate 
of getting well. And that's that's what we all want. Mm -hmm. And I know you're quoted as saying back pain is an epidemic and the 78,000 chiropractors in the United States are the foot soldiers who are fighting it. That's a powerful statement. Can you tell us more about that meaning and why it's important to you? Well, because chiropractors are entry-level providers and approximately 40 million patients a year are under chiropractic care. Mm -hmm. So we do an excellent job triaging and treating those patients. It's just as important to know if a patient is a chiropractic patient than how to treat one. Mm -hmm. So some of these patients need emergency care when they come in because they have problems that are other than chiropractic. An example would be kidney stones. Patients come in and present with acute lower back pain or flank pain. Uh, They could have diverticulitis. They could have a gallbladder issue. Uh, And they can have more serious problems as well. So it's important to go ahead and perform an examination, get these patients to where they need to be if they're not chiropractic patients. And the ones that are, the vast majority of of the ones that are, we we treat. Mm -hmm. But, you know, patients put their trust in us as healthcare providers, not just as chiropractors. So we're responsible for the person's health in general, Mm -hmm. not just the health of their spine. I and that's see. a big responsibility. Yeah, it is a big responsibility. I can see you're the foot on the ground that kind of leads them to know other ailments they may not necessarily know they have. That's correct. And, you know, it's a chiropractor's job to be able to diagnose, treat, or refer those patients on um, accordingly if, if they're not chiropractic patients. And by doing that, they build the respect of the medical community very quickly. Yeah. You, um, you're and that's the way it was in my office. You know, they they knew that if I if I you know treated a patient, they they knew that patient needed to be there, and they they were comfortable enough and confident enough with me as a person to know that if the patient really wasn't going to get you know treated um, from a chiropractic standpoint, that they were going to get referred on to a medical provider that could you know perform an exam or do whatever they do to have a better outcome for that patient. Yeah, that's excellent. We know you're a dominant figure in the neuroscience and neurosurgery field, participating in lecture series on chiropractic collaborations for comprehensive spina care. Um, How did you get involved with these lectures and what role do you want it to play for your fellow, fellow medical professionals? Well, um, I got involved because I run a program at Emory, and Emory is a hospital with a national footprint. So it was easy enough for other chiropractic associations to find out what I did, who I was and where I was, and reach out to me. And there were several stories written about our program at Emory that were picked up by other news services, one of which was the Mayo Clinic. So two years ago, I was invited to be the keynote speaker for their neurosurgical and neuroscience lecture series. And the title of my presentation was A Chiropractic Collaborative for a Comprehensive Spine Program. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what's fascinating about the whole thing is it allows me to go ahead and talk to a group of medical providers and let them know what chiropractors do and what we specialize in and how we can help in both sending patients and receiving patients to get a better um, outcome for the people that put their trust in us. So, Well, as a, after over 30 years of running one of the largest and most successful practices, you spent just three weeks in retirement, apparently, and that's such a short retirement. <laughs> what brought you back into the field after a short retirement? The hospital reached out to me and invited me to lunch after they found out I retired. And then at the end of the meeting, they hired me to be the first director of chiropractic relations in the 53-year history of the hospital. Wow, that's amazing. And that was really because I sent a high volume of patients there. Oh. So they had loaned me 
you know, uh, or known about me. They didn't know me, but they knew about me because they, they track referrals and they, they keep the metrics just like everyone else does. So uh, when I retired, they, they wanted to know what I was up to and my practice was still viable and if my associates would continue to refer to the hospital advanced imaging and everything north of that. Of course, the answer was yes. But then they were so fascinated with the fact that a chiropractor could be such a valuable referral source. Mm -hmm. They wanted to start a program, and they wanted me to lead it. Yeah, you, that, that's what we did. You have successfully created a way to connect freestanding imaging centers and specialty providers with hospital-based primary care, resulting in the largest referral service of its kind, the Chiropractic Referral Network. Would you tell us a little bit more about how this initiative? When we started our um, chiropractic program at the hospital, I realized that we would have to build an infrastructure that involved a network to go ahead and send patients to the hospital and patients that they could actually track. Mm -hmm. And imaging was only part of that. The downstream um, referral that came from the positive uh, imaging was um, surprising to the hospital. They realized that most Chiropractic referrals for MRI resulted in further specialty care. Mm -hmm. And the MRIs were positive for lack, you know, of a better term. So they are very impressed with the chiropractor's ability not only to identify which patients needed an MRI, but also um, how, how these MRIs did produce positive findings. So they realized we were good diagnosticians. They knew um, what um, the importance of evaluating these patients is and recognizing the fact that they did need additional advanced imaging was something that, you know, they were very impressed with. Yeah, that's incredible value to add. Um, regarding, you mentioned the Academy of Chiropractors a little bit ago. What impact do you hope to have this new initiative to have? Well, we are a group of like-minded, evidence-based chiropractors who look at chiropractic as a modality, not as something in totality. You know, chiropractic is a, is a treatment, not necessarily a cure. So what we're looking to do is work well with all other members in the healthcare profession to create better outcomes for our patients. Mm. That is, you know, doing what we do best and then referring those patients along for uh, either advanced imaging or collaboration of other types of medical services. So, you know, that's why the Academy was born. Yeah, to be a resource and a tool for complete medical care at your disposal. Healthcare. Yeah, healthcare. Yeah. What would you say is the most challenging aspect of your job? Most challenging aspect of my job is keeping my boyish figure. <laughs> okay. Because I go out to eat a lot. Mm. Um, that's one of the, the big um, struggles with the job. But just really the uh, struggle with the job is it's funny, I, I don't know exactly how to phrase it, but looking at patients or looking at other doctors and having them have the confidence that you're telling them the truth because what we do is actually too good to be true. So they have a tendency to um, possibly trust and verify. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's hard for them to realize that all ships can rise with an incoming tide. Yeah. Because everybody is looking for something and they want to understand, you know, what's, you know, hospitals, the first question they ask you is, why are you doing this, Steve? What's in it for you? Yeah. Well, it's not anything in it for me. Well, why would you send this patient? Yeah, they think well, there's an end game. You know, they need to be seen. Mm -hmm. Well, what's in it for you? Nothing. Well, how much does this cost? Zero. Yeah. So why would you do it? 
Well, we do it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Hmm. I'm going to have to think about that. Interesting, huh? You know, I'm sure there's, like, there's no hidden, you know, agenda here or there's nothing that I'm missing. So you're going to send it to patients and you're not going to charge us anything. I said, that's correct. Oh, why would you do it? Well, they need to be seen. And the only thing you have to do is say thank you. If you can say thank you and send the patients back to the chiropractors, then we can send patients. Yeah, that's, that that's interesting. So the challenge is the, there's no, uh, there's no other scheme. It's just, you know, patient care comes first. And that's unusual because of sometimes the business end of things. Right. And, you know, it depends upon the person that you speak to, right? Because comprehension is in the listener. Yeah. So it's possibly so, the most challenging thing is the re-education of, because you have such a new, um, innovative newer innovative position with the hospital so it's bringing that message and bringing the like-minded people alongside you and you know it's sometimes it's like you you know dating somebody i mean if you go out with, with somebody and they ask you to marry them on the first date you would think they were pretty weird mm -hmm. you know um, it's a process of building trust and finding out where your common interests lie. Yeah. In, in healthcare, a lot of these doctors are much more interested in who you are than in what you do. Because they think they already know what you do. You don't have to tell them what you do. You're a chiropractor and they already have a preconceived idea of what that is. Okay, it's like me calling a plumber. I call a plumber, and if I have a leak in the sink, I tell him, the sink's in there, go ahead and fix it. I don't ask him what tools he has in his tool chest. Yeah. I'm not interested in fixing my sink with a hacksaw, a drill, or a chisel. As long as he fixes my sink, it's reasonably priced, and it keeps my house clean. Yeah. So to me, all plumbers are the same. All electricians are the same. So, to a medical doctor, all chiropractors are the same. They work on backs and necks. So, I'm okay with that. You don't have to go in there and tell them you're special. Mm -hmm. You're different because you use an instrument or you use traction or you use therapy or you use a, a various techniques that you consider to be superior. They're really not interested in that. They know that chiropractors treat back pain. So if I have a patient that has back pain, I'm gonna send them over to deep because that's what he does. And all I care about is that that patient I sent has a good experience, is treated fairly, and when they come back, they say thank you. Because in our world, we're all judged by the quality of patients we refer. Mm -hmm. Of all people, I shouldn't say patients, we're all judged by the people we refer. So if I give you the name of a bad electrician or a bad real estate agent or a bad dentist, you're going to be upset with me. And you're going to come back and say, Steve, you know, that real estate agent that you sent me to was an idiot. You know, so you're, all, you're always judged by the quality of people that you refer. Yeah. That's why we need to be so careful with our referrals. Yeah, because, definitely. You know, we're judged by the quality of people that we refer. So, you know, that's important in helping build a practice. Because what you want to do is you want to build a practice that has a strong foundation. If you could give advice, um, if you could give advice to a, a new chiropractor coming into the space, like what two things would you tell your younger self? My younger self is that your reputation is the most important thing that you have because it's the only thing that precedes you. Mm -hmm. So guard it accordingly. Mm -hmm. And the same thing my basketball coach used to tell me, you need to work harder than everybody else. Yeah, that's true. If you want to be special and you want to stand out, you have to work harder and smarter than everybody else that's out there. 
when they used to motivate me for basketball practice, they used to show me a picture of the person that I would be guarding and then scream at me that, he, you know, he's taking an extra hundred foul shots. Wow. And he says, why aren't you? Yeah. You know, so you need to stay in the gym longer, you know, and you need to practice more or you need to get back in the weight room because he's, he's stronger than you or taller than you. And you need to work harder if you're going to succeed. So, you know, sports is a good, it's a good way to learn about life. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's not all about winning. In sports, you, you lose. You lose sometimes more than you win. Yeah. But it's being a gracious winner. And it's it's not being a sore loser. Exactly. So it teaches you how to, you know, roll with punches. And, you know, it teaches you that hard work usually winds up with a superior outcome. That's great advice. No, I appreciate you you giving that feedback. Um, we have two more questions. Um, are there new treatment methods emerging that you are truly excited about, or are the foundational principles of chiropractic still the primary path for care? Hopefully, there's always new treatment options for any healthcare provider because without growth and development, things can get pretty boring. However, the standard staple of chiropractic has always been the same. Yeah. Um, I think not only better treatment possibilities are there, but also better diagnosticians come along with better education and better mentorship. So, you know, just like every profession, there's got to be a certain amount of growth if the profession itself is going to grow. Mm -hmm. Um, some people, um, the la this is the last question, kind of dealing with the stigma of chiropractic care because some people feel uncomfortable with the notion of chiropractic treatments, like being adjusted due to negative stigmas by misinformation. Uh, what advice can you give your fellow do um, colleagues to help combat that in their own practice? I think it all comes down to the relationship, building trust with your patient. Mm -hmm. taking good care of your patient and educating them. Patient education is an important tool, maybe the most important tool in helping the practice grow. So give your patient, you know, websites, give them printed materials to review and read, and also case studies. I mean, I had patients that would come in and say, I'm not sure I want my neck adjusted because I read an article that manipulation of the cervical spine can produce a stroke. Yeah. I said that that is possible, but it is, it is extremely rare. Do you know chiropractic malpractice insurance is? Mm. No. I said, well, I'm going to make you guess. <laughs> I said, how much do you think it is? He said, I don't know, $100,000 a year. I said, <laughs> would you be surprised if I told you I paid $875 a year? You mean a month? I said, no, a year. I said, do you realize that I pay more for auto insurance than I do for malpractice insurance? So in other words, it's more dangerous for you to drive a car. Wow. To come in here for treatment. Yeah. You're kidding. I said, do you think the insurance companies care? The only thing they care about is money and claims. So I said, there's so few chiropractic claims for malpractice that my insurance is $875 a year. So the chances of you being injured in a chiropractic office are very small. And actually most injuries come about in chiropractic offices because the chiropractors don't perform a proper physical exam and don't take a proper case history. Oh, yeah, no, that is okay. good when you put it that way to for patient education. Do a complete exam, and you're thorough. The chances of anything bad happening in an office are small. So, to answer your question, you know, educating the patients, just like I educated you, mm -hmm. you know, it's very important in the treatment. And then at the end, you can say, "Listen, we we perform many different treatments." 
you know, if you're opposed to manipulation of the neck, we could take care of your neck in a number of ways. We could use an instrument that doesn't involve any rotation. We could use ultrasound, electric muscle stem. We can use long axis traction. We could use acupressure. You know, um, there's a number of things that we can use. Oh, I didn't know there were other techniques. I thought all you guys did was crack. No, that's only one technique. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. We have many different techniques. There's five different ways you can go. You can go take 75, 85, you can take 285, you can take 78. Which way is better? Depends upon the day, depends upon the traffic. I think that's a valuable perspective to educate patients and the way and perspective that you're sharing is very valuable. So thank you so much. With over 30 years of experience, we really appreciate your time.